So welcome to everybody who signed up for this Lyme Disease UK seminar this evening. And a very warm welcome to Dr. Robert Bransfield to the UK virtually, who has so generously given his time to allow members of our community to hear you speak, Dr. Bransfield. Um, Dr. Bransfield will give roughly a 20 minute presentation and then we'll take some questions that have been submitted to us prior to the event. If we have time at the end, because we only have an hour, we'll try to take some questions from the chat box. The event is being recorded, so you don't have to worry about writing down everything that's been said and will be uploaded to our free Lyme Disease UK YouTube channel shortly afterwards. If you um, subscribe to that, as I say, it's free, you'll get a notification when it's um, uploaded. Um, a little bit of um, housekeeping, please stay muted throughout the seminar so as not to distract Dr. Bransfield. Or everybody who needs an introduction to Dr. Bransfield. I don't think you'll mind if I read it because you've had a long and distinguished career. Um, so Dr. Bransfield is a graduate at Rutgers College and the George Washington University School of Medicine. He completed his psychiatric residency training at Shepherd and Enoch Pratt Hospital, is board certified by the American Board of Psychiatry and Neurology, and is a distinguished life fellow of the American Psychiatric Association. Dr. Bransfield's primary activity is an office-based private practice practitioner of psychiatry. In addition, Dr. Bransfield is past president of ILADS, the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Educational Foundation and the New Jersey Psychiatric Association. He has held a number of administrative positions with organizations involved with health, mental health and community re related activities. Uh, he is clinical associate professor of psychiatry at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. Dr. Bransfield has authored and co-authored a number of publications in peer-reviewed literature, other medical publications and books, and has been active in political advocacy on an international, national, state and local level. Phew, over to you, Dr. Bransfield, if you'd like to share your screen. Okay, thank you. Let me just, there. Okay, let me get the right screen up. Okay, all right, thanks for inviting me. And uh, what I'm going to do is cover basically some things that I've done and then address some of the questions and maybe I can incorporate some of the questions in this. Uh, first thing to talk about is autism. And uh, I've done a number of articles on autism and I think that it's a very significant thing with Lyme disease that's swept on the, under the rug. Uh, what we do find is that when you look at uh, children who have autism, you often see reactivity of 31 and 34 band on the Western blot, which is often eliminated from testing with many of the, the labs that do testing for Lyme disease, unfortunately. And there's, there's congenital autism and then there, there's regressive autism where you can see a regression around the age of two or so. Uh, also, the, there's I've done a few articles on psychoimmunology and Lyme disease, and that looks at connecting the links of how do you get an infection, and, and then after an infection, what happens that causes the symptoms? And the, the immune system is, is the key to answering that question. This is the latest thing, which is out of uh, Switzerland, and it's a uh, chapter in a book looking at how to do brain imaging uh, and to identify how infections cause activation of the immune system in the brain. In this case, microglia are the, like, the immune are significant, particularly in the immune system of the brain. And it, it helps to connect the dots of infection, immune provocation, symptoms. And this is a good way, I think, of describing what happens, that you get a... Um, we all have a microbiome and most of our 
cells in our human body are, are microbial more so than human, but there's the pathological microbiome. And when that happens with infection or um, pathogens, then that provokes, it, it directly causes some symptoms, but many of the symptoms are related to immune activation caused by the presence of these pathogens. That then leads to the symptoms. The symptoms then stress us out. And when we're chronically stressed, we then become more immunocompromised, which causes disease progression. And Lyme denial doesn't help it any. So how do you break that cycle? So one is treating the infection. Two is looking at how can you impact the immune system. And, and three is how can you uh, break that vicious cycle of chronic unremitting stress that, uh, causes a worsening and disease progression. Now, the article I did that seemed to be most popular was the article on suicide. I did that a few years ago. And in that I methodically looked at uh, suicide patterns and uh, often I would give a talk on suicide and I would say, how many of you in the audience here can relate to uh, know someone with Lyme who's been suicidal and an awful lot of hands would go up. And I think that's the number one cause of death associated with Lyme disease is suicide, but it's often not uh, counted that way. And, and since then there's been more attention and we need more attention on the subject of Lyme disease and suicide. And part of it is the physiology, how it affects the brain and the biochemistry. But part of it is often feeling uh, marginalized, demoralized, uh, you're, you're overwhelmed that nobody believes you and, and you're frustrated, that plus the, the physiology of it that pushes people towards suicide, those two, two things combined are quite a problem. Violence is less common, but it's something we have to pay attention to. Uh, we know the term Lyme rage. And in this case, I looked at 50 homicidal Lyme patients and said, what do they have that makes them different from other patients? It's a minority of Lyme patients that become homicidal. Uh, or, or aggressive, but that is there. Some get low frustration tolerance, irritability, whereas some it, it's more. So I don't want to overplay it, but it's something that we have to be attentive to. I sometimes get involved in legal cases where someone gets aggressive or kills someone, and, and then I'm trying to explain it, and we're trying to deal with it in the, in the court system. Intrusive symptoms is also something that's overlooked. And uh, what I've basically been trying to do is write about things that are overlooked with Lyme disease. And uh, people can describe this almost like clips from a horror movie, uh, frightening, stabbing, horrific images. So it could be an intrusive image. It could be an intrusive thought. It could be an intrusive emotion that just comes from nowhere. As one patient said, it invades the privacy of my mind. And I did a, a journal article with this where I assessed how many Lyme patients have intrusive symptoms and 34% of late stage patients have it. It's often hard for people to talk about this because it's like, where is this coming from, this thought? And it's some thought or image that's contrary to who you are and how you see yourself. Uh, but it's something that, uh, and it can correlate with nightmares or daymares somewhat during the day. Then, uh, what I did was I looked at an overview of what's the full spectrum of symptoms that we see with Lyme disease. And this was an article reviewing all the different things. And uh, I looked at close to 300 different symptoms and, and looked at the frequency of, you know, do, actually that's another article. But in this article, what I did was I did a journal review and looked at all the journal articles with different subcategories, such as depression, anxiety, and uh, trying to document what's been found that correlates with the, the psychiatric symptoms associated with Lyme disease. This is a, another article looking at what's psychosomatic or somatopsychic. Many doctors get, and people get confused by that. And you can have somatic illness, which is physical illness, psychiatric illness, and multi-system illness, and they all interplay. And there's often a tendency that when a patient comes to a doctor's office and there's, they have some complicated, confusing picture to call it psychiatric because there's some belief that psychiatric illness comes from nowhere, which isn't true. So multi-system illness is an illness like 
Lyme or, or COVID that can have physical as well as neuropsychiatric consequences. And uh, you have to look at the interplay and, and often look at medical uncertainty because invariably things in this category are things we really don't understand well. So as a result, a lot of people get these labels such as, and I addressed that in the article, all in your head, somatic symptom disorder, somatoform disorder, medically unexplained symptoms, functional neurological symptoms, conversion disorder, illness anxiety disorder, Munchausen by proxy, um, when mothers are concerned that their children has Lyme disease and the doctor doesn't believe that they sometimes get that label, functional disorder, psychogenic disorder, compensation neurosis, psychogenic seizures, psychogenic pain, psychogenic fatigue, delusional parasitosis with, with Morgellons, subjective symptoms, and therefore subjective symptoms are categorized as something that we can ignore, nonspecific or vague symptoms, bodily distress disorder, bodily distress syndrome. So there's this uh, whole collection of uh, mostly bogus diagnostic categories that are given when people don't understand what's happening with someone. So this, in this article, I looked at 100 patients that were clearly Lyme disease, well-documented cases of CDC positive. And I looked at what are the patterns that I saw in those patients and did a statistical analysis and then developed the diagnostic system based on that. So the result of that, and anybody can download this from the internet, are the screening questions, the 24 item patient self-assessment questions, the 61 items that are the more common symptoms, uh, and then the full, full assessment, 283 items. So that has 800 data points. And that's what I use when I do an assessment. And I try and encourage other doctors to do that too. And then the co-infection screen. So that's a clinical assessment tool. Um, another article we looked at was the IDSA had these guidelines and then we have ILADS guidelines. And then you have the, the guidelines in England uh, and, and all of them are different. And uh, so when the IDSA did their proposed guidelines, a part of doing it by grade uh, system, which is our way that guidelines are done now, they had to put it out on the internet and say, is there any feedback? And so I gave my feedback and I wrote a journal article and basically I found four flaws of areas I looked at. One is they have a disclaimer saying, these are just guidelines, so take it with a grain of salt. Uh, you can use your own judgment, basically. But yet, even though that's said that way, it's often enforced as a standard. So what is said and what it's done can be different. And um, then they also, with the laboratory work, they put undue credibility on, on surveillance criteria for making the definition. And if someone had a negative surveillance criteria, then that was often seen as not having Lyme disease. And then I looked at the psych and, and part and, and the child psych part in, in more detail, and they failed to really properly address that. So these guidelines, if really many people follow that, can be quite dangerous because it helps to continue the, the nearsightedness that's been a problem for a long time where these chronic illnesses are overlooked and then it can go past the point and get out of hand and lead to chronic disability. So in looking at the psychiatric literature, we ended up, this is a system of how you do a review. So we started with like 1900 journal articles looking at Lyme disease and psychiatry and reduced that down to uh, about 400 articles that were critical and uh, this is a breakdown. This is a, a systemic review, it's called. It's what's done in journal articles. And so that was breaking down into different categories. There's a lot with child. There's a lot with dementia. And uh, then in summary, we found there's basically 400 journal articles showing a, a causal association between Lyme disease and psychiatric illness and over 70 between Lyme disease causing dementia. But the IDSA in their guidelines, they only looked at four articles. And um, they had, so they what we call cherry pick. So they looked at 0.4% of the entire literature. 
and based their opinion on that. And they ba basically then said, well, there's really no association between Lyme disease and psychiatric illness. Um, so we then, uh, in ILAD, we, we defined chronic Lyme disease. Uh, Dr. Stricker also defined chronic Lyme disease. So there's two definitions that are both very close. And we defined it as a multi-system illness with a wide range of symptoms and or signs that are either continuous or intermittently present for a minimum of six months. And then we broke it down into two categories. One category being where it was never treated in the first place or the second category where it was inadequately treated or previously treated. This, this is the next project I'm working on, which is Lyme and addiction. And this is another uh, neglected area. We're seeing more addiction, uh, particularly with the, the pandemic. Uh, we're seeing an increase, but addictive disorders have been on the rise. And this is an article that I've kind of halfway finished. I've done a couple of presentations. Okay. Somebody has their, their thing on that needs to be turned off. So Lyme and addiction, Often people that are inadequately treated may turn towards self-medicating, benzos, hypnotics, alcohol, pain meds, marijuana, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, sometimes process addiction. Um, and you, I think we've seen a fair number of fatalities because of this. Uh, so it's another cause of mortality with Lyme disease, not just illness. Now, the latest thing to look at, everybody's looking at COVID and what's the connection of Lyme and COVID and COVID is drawing more attention to these, the effects of chronic infections and how that impacts people. So we think of syphilis as being the great imitator historically. Lyme was considered the new great imitator and COVID now is probably the third great imitator. So we have all these symptoms, fatigue being the main one like we often see and then all these other, other symptoms. Now there's a lot of similarity between what we see with COVID and Lyme disease. Uh, now, one thing that came out recently is that the, the COVID virus seems to be incorporated into the human genome in some cases. So that's rather scary that uh, not only do you get this, but it can become a part of your, uh, your, your, uh, your DNA uh, after you're infected in some cases. Uh, this is an article out of the United Kingdom, and it looked at 236 patients and said, well, what are the residual symptoms? And 33% uh, received a neurological and or psychiatric diagnosis, stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, dementia, psychotic illness, hallucinations, memory losses, etc. I'm not sure if dementia is the right word because I, I, I see a lot of cognitive impairments. Now, COVID has more uh, blood vessel disorder. You see more stroke than Lyme, uh, more pulmonary. There are differences between COVID and, and late stage Lyme. Um, and particularly people that have been hospitalized have a high rate of psychiatric illness. Now they compared what's the, the follow-up from COVID in the United Kingdom versus Austria. And, for, and the, the, what comes up a lot is depression, anxiety, and insomnia. That's often a post-acute COVID finding. And, um, but for some reason, people that had COVID in the United Kingdom had these findings three times as much as in Austria. I don't know why that was. Maybe there was a different strain in Austria. Did Austria treat it more effectively? Who knows? I don't know what accounts for that difference, but it's an interesting finding. Then this is a study where they looked at um, uh, many different studies and uh, looked at looked at fifty looked at uh, data from thirty seven hundred people from fifty six hundred uh, different countries, and often there were nine organ systems involved. Fatigue was the most commonly reported symptom. Post exertional malaise. That's where. You, you get fatigued very easily from minimal activity, cognitive dysfunction, relapse of symptoms with exercise or mental activity and st or stress, and 22% were not working and ended up maybe looking like disability. So disability can be a big fallout. Uh, another study um, looked at the idea that 
a lot of times this causes psychiatric symptoms. And again, anxiety disorders, insomnia, depression, uh, but and dementia, some of the same things keep coming up. And uh, it seems if you have psychiatric illness, you're more likely to have a more severe outcome from COVID. And if you have COVID, you're more likely to have uh, uh, psychiatric illness. So the two things can feed on each other. Uh, this is one example. There's a doctor in New York who who got who acquired COVID and then killed herself. And I think now now it's hard to say. Was that the physiology, or is it the the burnout? A lot of healthcare workers were burnt out by uh, what they've been dealing with with this pandemic, or a combination of the two. So many of the same thing with COVID that we see with Lyme disease. This was a review of all the different articles looking at um, uh, looking at what are the symptoms of COVID. And the most common was fatigue, headache, attention span disorder, hair loss, uh, dyspnea of shortness of breath. So hair loss, uh, you're seeing quite a bit with COVID. A lot of women don't like that, but it's, it's there. It's, uh, you see hair loss with Lyme disease, but you see more of it with COVID. And then neurological symptoms can be dementia, depression, anxiety, uh, OCD, confusion, vertigo, dizziness, tinnitus. So you're seeing some cranial nerve symptoms also. Um, now, one interesting th finding is that we give vaccine, there's, I hate this term long haulers. It's like long haulers is a trucker term. It's chronic. Chronic is chronic. If it's more than three or six months, depending on your definition, it's chronic. But a lot of these people with post-acute or chronic COVID seem to improve after they get the vaccine. So why is that? So it makes you think maybe there's chronic infection. You, you draw the distinction of chronic symptom versus chronic infection. Um, so that's, we need to look at that more and try to understand that. Uh, it doesn't happen to everybody, but with some people. And I think with any infection, there's a hit and run infection and it's done when it's done. And then there's persistent infection and there's a persistent process that causes uh, the symptoms that exist. So this is a, one of many studies, it's a Lambert study looking at the main symptoms of COVID and fatigue was number one. Uh, but you could see a lot of those uh, are neuropsychiatric program. Now, now there are the pulmonary, the shortness of breath, uh, cough, that's more a COVID symptom, but compared to Lyme disease, there's a lot that overlap. Um, Fatigue is very significant, uh, attention span problems, concentration problems. And that right-hand column is my study that I did where I analyzed the 100 patients and what's the percent of each symptom that I see. And, and those are the percentage compared to COVID. So they're both similar. They're both zoonotic diseases that come and go with animals. They're emerging diseases. They both have variations. They have chronic symptoms. And then we say, is it reinfection or reactivation or is it chronic? You know, is it chronic infection? And there's a lot of financial conflict of interest that bias the direction of how it's uh, viewed or how research uh, funding goes. And many of the same off-label treatments work, interestingly. So now we have two pandemics at the same time. And how does one affect the other? What happened if you get both, okay? so. Often now we're seeing, and this is a recent article, that someone had Lyme disease and they also had COVID, but um, uh, they overlooked the Lyme disease. So you have to always, you can't be so COVID focused. And I think especially as we get into the, the spring and you're going to see an uptick on uh, Lyme disease, you, you, you have to consider Lyme and COVID together in the same diagnosis. And um, and then have to look at how, how do they interact, okay? So my experience has been, if someone has a latent or active case of Lyme and they're not in active treatment and acquire COVID, there, there can be a worsening of their Lyme symptoms. Um, now, occasionally I've seen some people get the COVID, get a very high fever, and then they have some improvement. Maybe it somehow provokes their immune system, but that's a minority. But if someone is in active treatment for Lyme and they get COVID, they often do rather well because many of the Lyme treatments are effective in treating COVID. Maybe not all, such as the ivermectin. Now, fluoxamine, um, which is an OCD med, seems to be quite effective. 
the hydroxychloroquine, mepron, other malaria treatments, Cithromax. Diselfram seems to be quite effective. Uh, and there's some journal articles supporting that. Quercetin, different um, vitamins, A, B3, C, D, zinc, and acetylcysteine, anything that improves immune function, the methylene blue. So uh, Dr. Stricker's proposal is because in his Lyme patients, they did quite well, um, you often, what may be good is to give uh, uh, the treatments we give for Lyme at the first sign of any problem. And some of our Lyme treatments may be good prophylactically. Um, this is a, a ivermectin study looking at giving ivermectin to what's the long haulers of the post-acute um, COVID and it helped. So maybe there's something about the ivermectin that is uh, maybe th then we are dealing with persistent infection with these uh, what's called long haulers or post-acute symptoms. So what you find is that our system often fails poorly with emerging diseases such as Lyme, chronic fatigue, myalgic encephalitis, autism, fibromyalgia, AIDS, Gulf War syndrome, Morgellons, Pandas, Bartonella, Mycoplasma, mold sensitivity, multiple chemical sensitivity. So bureaucrats don't have a good handle on it and then bureaucrats get in control of it and they're too far away from the front line and they call the shots and it, uh, it's unfortunate, but it happens that way. So what we're gonna see then is as we come out of this, we're gonna have all these chronic symptoms, the anxiety, depression, substance use, suicidality, stress, trauma, and at the same time, the healthcare profession, mental healthcare profession is being depleted and burn out from dealing with this. So that's gonna create a crisis. It's not just a uh, need to look at getting the vaccine, but what are we gonna do with the fallout from it? Now, I did an article where I looked at my hypothesis is all the infections in World War I caused a lot of brain damage that resulted in the leaders of war, uh, in the next generation being impaired and that contributed to World War II. I hope the same doesn't happen here, that um, would we have a lot of mental impairments in millions, possibly billions globally? And what would the effect of that be upon world peace? You know, it'll have a significant impact on illness, but what about mental capability and our ability to get along with each other and, and the socioeconomic problems and the shutdown? What's the fallout from that? That's kind of scary. So although there's competing interest like there is with anything, uh, with both Lyme and COVID, we, we want to do something to prevent needless suffering, disability, and uh, insight into this and advocacy helps and we need to do something to be uh, effective. These are a couple of um, the articles that I did uh, recently. It's not all the articles, but some that are recent. And uh, then there's some, there's some more of the articles. And then um, these are a couple of the video talks that I've done recently, similar to this type of presentation. So maybe you could then open it up to questions. And uh, uh, you had some interesting questions. And let's go ahead with that, OK? OK. So if you want to stop sharing your screen. Yeah. yeah, there we go. So I've got quite a few questions that we've had submitted to us. So I'll go through them. Some of them sort of overlap and you have covered bits of it, but people are asking in some cases, similar questions. So the first one is um, you have previously been quoted as saying that psychiatric manifestations of Lyme disease are the last to arrive and the hardest to get rid of. Apart from lowering inflammation and treating the infections with antimicrobial, antimicrobials and herbs or prescription, um, oh sorry, anti I couldn't read what I'd written, antimicrobial herbs or prescription antibiotics, is there anything else we can do to regain our psychiatric health? Okay, well that's... Uh... I, I do think that what often happens is someone's inadequately treated. If someone's never treated for Lyme disease, then they may have the joint pains that, uh, or maybe the cranial nerve symptoms that people recognize as part of the diagnosis. But when they've had a partial treatment, those may not be so obvious. And then you go on to have the other symptoms. Usually do, you do not get the psychiatric symptoms from Lyme disease a week, a month, or even a year after the treatment. 
sometimes in autoimmune cases, but often you're looking at years. Like in the study that I did, the average patient was nine years post uh, infection. So it, and it often takes more to treat these symptoms. So if someone's only looking at the joints and if the joints improve, and then they say, well, that's the time to stop treatment. They're overlooking the psychiatric part. And it's a lot harder to, you know, impact the psych things because they're more deeply entrenched. So, and, and there's often a failure with infectious disease doctors to connect the links. Now, in terms of treatment, uh, you can look at it one way is treat mm -hmm. with antimicrobials. Uh, that's one thing. Another approach is to look at impacting the immune system since the immune system is the intermediary. And a third approach is treat symptoms that contribute to the vicious cycle. And that goes with that um, cycle of disease that I've, uh, that I've seen that I have the slide for, okay? So um, now they are symptomatic treatment can help. So yeah. actually yeah. psychotropics can help. Now, if you realize the first antibiotic, antidepressant was actually an antibiotic. A lot of psych meds have immune and psychiatric capabilities, but if, if psychiatric meds help improve quality of sleep and reduce stress, that helps improve immunocompetence. And immunocompetence, when it's compromised, a big part of disease progression. So anything that improves the competency of the immune system is quite effective. So your immune system maybe is your biggest ally and you wanna do everything to make it effective. And the immune, using your own immune system may be more effective than any antimicrobial treatment. Okay, so number two, why do you think sleep can be profoundly affected by tick-borne infections causing either hypersomnia or profound insomnia? What do you find can help both of these? Well, if, if you look at uh, journal articles, there's only two journal articles in existence looking at Lyme and sleep disorder, although I've given a couple of talks on them on that subject. But there's a lot of articles looking at how sleep deprivation contributes to being immunocompromised. And sleep deprivation contributes to cognitive impairments and fatigue. That's what's called the, the terrible triad. And those are often your most disabling chronic symptoms, the, the fatigue and the cognitive impairment. Um, and it's not just sleep, but it's quality of sleep. It's delta sleep. And that's what is restorative. And, and, and when you have deep sleep, that's when interstitial uh, space expands between neurons and the garbage is taken out of the nervous system, so to speak. And there's a series of journal articles documenting this. So, when you get deep sleep, that's also what, where the immune system gets activated. Early, it, it, it helps infl the inflammatory response and later it helps the uh, adaptive immune response. So if you don't get the deep sleep and enough sleep, then you're gonna be immunocompromised and all the antibiotics in the world may not be helping you enough if, if you're not sleeping, you're immunocompromised. Now, problem is that most, Lyme patients, my study was like 76 or 78 percent, had, had non restorative sleep. So that's a vicious cycle that the Lyme causes by being in a pro and constantly pro inflammatory state that causes your sleep to be compromised. There's also other things like restless leg and nightmares and anxiety and spastic bladder and, and air hunger and many things that interfere with the capacity to sleep sleep apnea so and depression. So you have to address all those pieces that contribute to poor quality sleep in whatever way you can. But, and when I've, and I've treated thousands of patients over 30 years, and usually the first thing I, I'll go through my list of uh, uh, 300 symptoms. And in the end, usually what I end up doing the most is improving restorative sleep and reducing chronic stress, because those are the two things that impede recovery. So anything that helps that is, is a, often a high priority for someone. And some of that's prescription meds, some of it's just lifestyle issues. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, are there differences between the psychiatric manifestations of Babesia and Bartonella? That, that's a great question. And I wish I could answer that better. Often what we see is with these cases that have a lot of psych manifestation, you see Lyme, Babesia, and Bartonella. And uh, at first with the whole, we paid more attention to Lyme, then we started paying attention to Babesia, and now we're paying more attention to Bartonella. And we see some cases that are just Bartonella. Now a problem can be is that it's hard to test often for Bartonella and uh, it's hard to test for Lyme. But, in, and, uh, but there are cases that, you know, only Bartonella and some of the Bartonella cases can be very neurological. And uh, so preponderance of neurological symptoms and psych symptoms, you think of Bartonella. Um, the Babesia, you know, there's subtle things like you see more sweats, um, but they're very, very close. And a lot of people have both, I think. It's, and probably, even though they're two different kinds, three different kinds of infections, when you look at the three, maybe they both impact and perturb the immune system in the same way, causing very similar symptoms. Okay. Um, what are your top tips for anybody who can't access treatment at all? to help themselves a little? Well, I, I think the average person that gets Lyme with chronic symptoms may be a rather stoic person. You look at who might get Lyme. It's not someone who sits at home all day and watches television. It's usually someone who's out of nature. So it's often a lover life, mover and shaker who's outdoors doing things. They may be a jogger, a hiker, that sort of thing. And then when they get it, they then fight it often in their usual stoic kind of manner of push your way through it. And that doesn't work with Lyme. So I think you have to be able to allow yourself to rest and recoup, even when it may be contrary to the person's fundamental personality. And uh, that's something that a person has to work through and accept. Sometimes you have to regress in order to recover. And um, I think get adequate amount of sleep, um, Avoid uh, sugar that might put you in a more pro-inflammatory state. Be attentive to the nutrition issues. Avoid unremitting stress. Now that's hard to do because you have an illness that stresses you and it's hard to keep up your daily routine like you used to. So you're burning your candle on both ends. Think of the brain as an allocation of resources machine so that you can fight a battle effectively on two fronts at once. So if you're pushing and, and driving yourself in that type A, stoic, hard driving way, you're doing it at the expense of energy going inside to help healing and recovery. So you have to back off and reduce what you're doing in order to shift towards what we might what we call sickness syndrome rather than stress syndrome. So you're, you're dealing more with allowing your body to regenerate and fight internally instead of dealing as much with an internal external environmental stress. I think a lot of people, I know I can relate to that, where you've probably been, as you say, a very outdoorsy person or uh, a, somebody who who's constantly achieving in their own field. And when your body, you know, hits a big infection like this, it's very hard to to not say, well, I'm going to do it. I, I'm not going. I, I'm not going to rest. And uh, you know, I've experienced that. It's, it's very difficult for some people. See, that was part of the the guidelines that once existed for dealing with chronic fatigue uh, syndrome, where where thinking, well, just push your way through it, mm -hmm. ignore it, don't give in to it, and that didn't work. And uh, that was that was pushed down people's throats, and it made people worse. Finally, at least people saw through that and they stopped. They realized it was a mistake. And, uh, but I think we have to learn from the mistakes with chronic fatiguing illnesses are all similar in that regard, whether it's the 
uh, chronic fatigue syndrome, encephalitis myalgia, or Lyme disease. They're all similar that way. Yeah. Now, this is quite an interesting one, and I think that you've probably touched on it. But um, so somebody says, somebody wrote in and said, um, two to three years after having Q fever pneumonia, I presume tick bite, I started to become severely depressed and, and started to have appalling nightmares and fatigue. Do you think this is a rare or uncommon manifestation? Or are there people who have psychiatric manifestations which are never recognized or picked up? So he well, had think... two or three years after his infection, he, he started with psychiatric symptoms. Okay, well, if it's Q fever, then you think, okay, what else did you get? And when you get a tick bite, uh, think of it like, what's, what's a tick bite? A tick, and I could do an experiment. I'll go out in the woods and I'll draw a bud from mice, uh, skunk, possum, um, squirrel, any, any lizard, anything I could find, and then I'll, I'll inject that into you. So that's basically what a tick bite is. You don't know what you're getting. Now, maybe Q fever, maybe Lyme or something's identified, but what else is there, okay? So I think these are far more complicated than we realize. Now, it sounded like there, there was that progress, the disease progression. And then there were intrusive symptoms, what I, I was talking about. And a, a significant number of people with these chronic infections and it's not just Q fever, but I think it's the whole group of them. And it's hard to say why not everyone gets it, but a certain percent do. Uh, those are the intrusive symptoms. They could be nightmares or, or they could be intrusive during the day. Those we treat with a lot, similar to the way we treat post-traumatic stress disorder. It's very similar to post-traumatic stress disorder where there are intrusive symptoms and that causes hypervigilance, avoidance and, and uh, emotional numbing as a defense mechanism. So um, that's, uh, that's, that makes perfect sense. But if then the, the intrusiveness can be treated with those treatments um, and, and there are certain meds that reduce it, then uh, that could help break the cycle. The person could sleep better. And then if they sleep better, then their immune system stronger. I think that's a way to kind of deal with that. Mm -hmm. uh, one of your slides uh, touched on this. So somebody was asking, can Lyme disease or tick-borne infections cause autism-like symptoms? Yeah, yes, and I think some people, it's, you know, you can see it full-blown, but you can see it a milder degree. And if you look at autism, the whole spectrum, like some of these people have sensory sensitivity, uh, stimulation sensitivity. A lot of patients have that. A lot of Lyme patients have that. They can get sensory overload, similar to what we see as a part of autism. Another part of autism can be... Um, of the impairment in emotional processing uh, with um, looking at uh, emotional reciprocity, reading emotions, reading social cues. You can see that sometimes with people. So you can see mild degrees of it, I think, with a lot of people that's part of what we call the spectrum. Now that we used to call that Asperger. Um, now that's, that word isn't used, but the spectrum is really very broad. Uh, with uh, what's considered autism spectrum compared, to, and you, you need to break it down in the subcategories. Okay, uh, somebody else was asking, they've developed um, problems with social interaction, which they describe as an inability to speak up in the moment. Does the infection cause this? Uh, yes, it can. Now, it could be a couple of ways. One is it can, the infection can reduce in slow processing. And you think of Lyme predominantly as white matter rather than gray matter problems. And white matter is how fast we can process information. So we're having a conversation right now and you say something and now I have to digest what you say. That takes a while. And then I have to compose my thoughts, that takes a while, and get it out. Now, if you have slow processing, there's great difficulty keeping up with the pace of the conversation. It's a little bit like, I don't know if 
you watch Peanuts cartoons in the United Kingdom. When the adults are talking, it's wah, 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 wah. And information's almost like that, where it's, or it's like a slow computer, the old computers that would take a minute to get on a website. So it takes too long to process and it takes too long to process your answer. And now the conversation keeps progressing. Uh, a lot of times uh, uh, a medication called memantadine, uh, which is an in America is helpful for that. That helps processing speed. That's slow processing. Now, if you're reading, you can read at a slow pace. And many students, it may take five hours to do two hours worth of homework. But in everyday conversation, it's difficult. Now, another part of that is many blind patients acquire social anxiety they didn't have before. And some of that is just a feeling of social sensitivity that you're being scrutinized. That's more exaggerated. Some of it is that sensitivity is you're aware you have difficulties you didn't have before, and that makes you more sensitive. So you have the combination of social anxiety, and then you have the slow processing, and then there may be a frustration intolerance that also can be a part of Lyme. So it can be very frustrating because you can't keep up with things the way you used to. And, and all that makes it very hard to be in a quick debating situation or not even quick debating, but in everyday conversational speech, it's hard to keep up with the pace. And I think the sensory overload can further add to it. So you have to look at how are all these symptoms that you can get from Lyme disease? What does any given person have and how do they interact with each other? And that's what you're always trying to do to figure this out. It's like a puzzle with each person. We know what happens with some people, what, what happens with any given person? What symptoms do they have? How do their symptoms interact that make them stressed and, and make it difficult for them to lead their lives the way they want? Thank you. Uh, there's a couple here that go together. So can you explain, which I know you've sort of touched through all along in, on a lot of these questions. Can you explain why Lyme causes such debilitating levels of anxiety? And do you have any tips for reducing this or are there any supplements that you recommend that might help? Well, well Lyme, one part of it is, and I did touch the sensory overload. And that's something that... A, uh, a lot of times, you know, I'm just starting to pay more attention to that. So one time we had a, a line meeting that we scheduled for the American Psychiatric Association and they assigned the location for us. And where they assigned was Times Square, the Marriott McKee. So that's the worst place in the world for a Lyme patient to go with the sensory overload. And uh, so I think the sensory overload, that's hyper arousal, that's part of it. But when you break it down into different anxiety subtypes, I can see an increase of generalized anxiety. I see an increase of obsessive compulsive disorder. I see an increase of social anxiety disorder. Uh, I see an increase of post-traumatic stress disorder. So all your anxiety subtypes may be increased more so in one person or another. And I think, you know, what is anxiety? Uh, anxiety is emotional activation you can't channel. So anxiety occurs and it can be associated with fear, but not always. And there's more to be afraid of. So there's more specific phobias. Lyme patients often develop spider phobia for some reason. But if, um, so you have this higher level of fear and it's harder to be productive. So that's what anxiety is, emotional activation. It's almost like I'm gunning the engine in my car, but I'm in neither forward nor reverse. So I get, emotionally stimulated by something, but I don't know what to do with it. I don't know a good action plan. So if you can clearly identify what the issue is and identify the action plan, that helps to reconcile anxiety. But it is a physiological trait that you see shifted after someone gets uh, these infections. And sometimes when it's significant enough, we may wanna treat one of these anxiety subtypes, depending on how disabling it is. Uh, so this question obviously ties in with that. Somebody's asked, many sufferers experience adult panic attacks for the first time ever. Can you give any advice on how to deal with these and will they resolve with treatment? Well, they can resolve with treatment and Lyme panic attacks are quite different than panic attacks we see with other, from other causes. 
Panic attack and attention deficit disorder are the two psychiatric conditions that correlates most strongly with, with genetic risk. But Lyme panic attacks are different. They can last longer. Whenever a panic attack would last longer than a half hour, it's caused by Lyme. I think that's a rather almost black and white statement I can make. So that, and they can often describe it as rolling panic attacks. They can just be persistent. So, and panic attack, if you think of it, panic attacks is our alarm circuit. So when there's imminent danger, then uh, say someone points, suddenly points a gun at you, it's fright, fight, flight, you get that imminent alarm system, that's panic. And when you look at psychiatric illness in general, think of the brain as a gear shift and the, the brain shifts us into different states of functioning that are appropriate for the current life situation. Just like you shift the gear of a car when you're going uphill or downhill. So when you're in a dangerous situation, you're more fearful. Um, this, but you should have panic when you're in imminent danger, but not when you're not. And then once you get panic attacks, then you get fear of fear and it's a vicious cycle. Now things that can block panic attacks, such as some of the, the, the psych meds, the antidepressants as a group might, and sometimes the drugs that work with uh, uh, reducing adrenaline. But um, it's when you treat the Lyme, when you treat the infection that contributes to it, then these improve, they can go away. But it's, uh, you, you do see that. And I think it's, it's a red flag when someone has a long duration panic attack, Lyme disease, or, or maybe we're better off saying Lyme tick-borne disease. Who knows if it's Bartonella babesia, but it's in that complex. Okay. Um, somebody's written in and said, I feel like a lot of my symptoms are related to Bartonella and I struggle a lot with depersonalization and OCD. And a lot of the time it feels like I'm sort of possessed, which one I think one of your slides touched on. Mm -hmm. what, what are your views on the best protocol for these particular symptoms? I presume what medications can help? All right, so if there, um... You know, when you look at Bartonella, the couple, even though many symptoms overlap, you may look for the stria, you may look at the pain in the soles of the feet, the predominance of neurological symptoms. Um, and maybe there's a bit of a more of an autoimmune piece as compared to inflammatory piece. So there may be more ups and downs that are more abrupt with the Bartonella. Um, the, you can off see the, the psychic numbing sometimes. So a person detaches and they feel depersonalized. And that's a scary thing, but that's sometimes the defense mechanism that just kind of kicks in. Uh, and there are some things that help with that. Um, and um, what was the other thing? I just want to go back and clarify. Could you just read that again? Because I, I don't know if I got all the question there. Um, I feel like a lot of my symptoms are related to Bartonella. But I struggle a lot with depersonalization and OCD. Okay. The depersonalization, think of what depersonalization is. Uh, if you have bad post-traumatic stress with bad intrusive symptoms, uh, compare it to, let's say you're being tortured, you know, what would you do psychologically? You would depersonalize. And depersonalization is detachment. So you're, you're more distanced from your existence so that you feel less pain. But then once you do that, being depersonalized is difficult in and of itself. So it may be that the OCD, the intrusiveness, and part of OCD is the intrusive symptom, and the other part is the looping after that intrudes. So I get an intrusive symptom, it's annoying, but now I can't get it out of my head and it just keeps repeating. Different things may help the intrusiveness, the more the post-traumatic stress meds. Uh, the Topamax, the Prazosin, uh, uh, the Periactin might help that, whereas the looping, it's more our OCD meds, you know, the, the fluoxetine, the, the SSRIs, the uh, anaphronil, those meds help that. Now, depersonalization per se. So think of this like a row of dominoes and how do the dominoes fall? And if you can impact the first domino, it's better than last. Now, the last then is the depersonalization. And their lamotrigine, which is a uh, uh, anti-seizure med that is also used in mood save 
there's a journal article showing that that has some effectiveness with depersonalization, but you're depersonalizing because you're in distress and you're in distress from a specific symptom. If you can address that symptom and the cause of the symptom, then you can work your way back through the dominoes that caused it. And you feel like a ghost, like you're there, but you're not there, like Scrooge in A Christmas Carol. It's a very frustrating thing. And then some people sometimes do things that try to bring them back from that. Sometimes you see superficial cutting or sometimes intense, sometimes self-destructive behavior to get out of that state of depersonalization because it's so uncomfortable. Okay, well, we've only got two minutes left. Okay. Um, you've answered every question. I'm afraid we won't have time to go through the chat box, but what we'll do is we'll save the chat box and maybe see if you would feel like answering a few in your own time and we can put them on our um, website afterwards. Okay, that'd be fine. Okay. There's one question just to finish with, which I think a lot of people, um, you know, it can relate to. So what would you say to people who feel they have no hope? Well, I think um, there really is a lot of hope. All these things, it can seem overwhelming. In my study, when I looked at my patient, the average patient had 82 different symptoms. And it's like, well, how do you deal with that? But you break it down and you look at the linchpins, the key symptoms, and how do the symptoms fit together? All this is very logical and can be well explained. When you, if you understand the physiology and the sequence of how it occurs, and there really is hope when you understand it. Uh, think of the word crazy. What is crazy? Crazy is what you don't understand. And when you understand something, it empowers you. And these things are very understandable, even though we're, there's pieces we, we have different degrees of knowledge about, and that, that knowledge of how the sequence occurs in the progression of these conditions. And, and look at it, you have to look at the total ecology, then you look at ticks and you look at white-footed mice and you, you, then you have to connect that to um, how the bite occurs, how the immune system occurs, uh, immune activity in the body, how that then affects the brain, how that then affects behavior, how society reacts so to really understand Lyme disease, you really have to know a lot of different fields of science and, and pull it together. You cannot have what, what we call silo mentality and just look at one thing where, where, and that's where we get into trouble. That if I say, well, I only look at infections and if the culture's negative, it's gone or I only look at psychiatric illness and I don't look at anything. You have to connect all those dots we're, we have this problem because people aren't connecting the dots. But when you connect the dots and see the full sequence and even the sequence within an individual person, then you are empowered and you are hopeful because these things really can be helped. And uh, they're not that you know, mystifying when you understand it. It is quite logical, okay? So don't give up hope. I think that's a really, really positive note to finish on. And um, we'd like, you know, from our charity and everybody who's registered and signed in to give you a really big thank you for giving us this time today. Thank you. Thank you. And it's a pleasure doing this. And I hope it helps. And uh, it's, uh, this is a global pandemic. And uh, together, I think we can do something. I hope maybe the, the COVID draws awareness to the long-term impact of infections. And may, would that spill over and make people more aware of, these problems that we've been struggling with so long with Lyme disease or other things like the chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, all those other conditions that are all very similar, that um, the easy things in medicine have already been figured out, but these big complicated things that span multiple disciplines, that's where our healthcare system is, is paralyzed and non-functional and, and not making enough forward progress. So thanks. Yeah, thanks really. Yeah. We really appreciate it. And for everybody Thanks. listening, um, just a reminder that this has been recorded and it will be uploaded on our free Lyme Disease UK YouTube channel. If you'd like to subscribe, as I say, it's free and you'll get a notification once it's uploaded. Thank you very much, Dr. Pranceville.
Okay, thanks. Bye.